in 2010, Warren and Maureen Nierges received a notice from Bank of America that their house was being foreclosed upon uh, for lack of payment on their mortgage, which was really interesting uh, to Warren and Maureen because they didn't have a mortgage with Bank of America. In fact, they didn't have a mortgage with anyone. See, just about a year prior, 2009, they had purchased a home in Naples, Florida, and they had spent quite a long time researching the area, the homes, and they were looking for one that they could pay for 100% in cash. They had a dream that they would get a home that could be fully theirs, that they wouldn't have to live under debt to a bank. They wouldn't have to worry during their years of retirement whether they, how they would pay for their home, that anybody could take it. They wanted to be secure in where they lived. And here they were finding themselves in a battle with a bank with seemingly unlimited resources uh, over proving that they own their house. And so they set out, they hired an attorney, And they went on this two-month-long legal battle to prove that they owned their home, that Bank of America did not have a right to put a lien and to foreclose on them, to ultimately seize their house and go through another foreclosure sale. And fortunately for them, they were able to convince a judge that they did, in fact, own their home, that that Bank of America did not have a right to it. And they they, ended up getting a settlement, actually, from Bank of America for $2,500 to cover all legal expenses. Unfortunately, at this time, around 2010, uh, there were several thousand cases like this that happened with multiple banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, other nationwide banks, uh, in which homeowners... Uh, were foreclosed upon, that they were, they were approached by banks, told that they were taking their houses back because uh, they ha- were delinquent in their payments. And these were people who, like the air, just had owned their home outright. They didn't have a mortgage or who had been paying for decades, uh, making payments on time in full month after month. And for some of them, uh, they didn't have the resources to fight back. Their homes were taken from them. They lost what they had been working for for years and years. Their security ripped away from them. And it was a reminder for everyone watching that in this world, there are no assurances. There are no guarantees that the things you work for, the things you have earned, the things you have been promised, even those can be taken from you. And it's a lesson that I think a lot of us learn over the years growing up, that there is nothing guaranteed in life. And the problem with that lesson that we learn is too often we will apply it to our faith. We'll look at the things we believe, the promises of God, and we'll look at them with doubt and suspicion because that's that's how we will look at everything in the world. We we understand that there's nothing to be assured of and we apply that to the promises, the truth, our salvation. And I've heard it all through my life growing up, people asking questions, will I receive what God has promised? Really, is he good for what he says? Do I get heaven? I've heard it all my life. Yeah, God gave me this free gift of grace. I get eternal life. But am I going to uphold now my end of the bargain? Am I somehow going to lose what God has given to me? And I grew up in the Catholic church and some of their beliefs, and I've heard them spread throughout the non-Catholic Christian religions. And it's come to me in forms of questions that I've even dealt with recently. Will I lose uh, my salvation If in a moment of weakness and hurt, pain, depression, whatever it may be, if I take my life or if my friend that I love took their life, does that mean I no longer get heaven and then destined to hell? Or or if I if I don't die if I die uh, long enough from the last time I ask for forgiveness or uh, one that I was taught as a kid if you don't have a priest to confess your sins too close to your death you may not go to heaven. This is a a belief that we've taken from what we see in the world and we've imposed it on God. And today we're going to look at what assurances do we have? What assurances do we have from God about our salvation? And what does that have to do with the Holy Spirit? We're in this, this series looking at the Holy Spirit, all that he does. What role does he play in that? And today we're going to be looking at 
Ephesians 1, uh, verses 11 through 14, this short uh, four-verse passage that create, that contains a lot of power. And so what Paul is doing is he's writing to the church in Ephesus, this, this church that he's helped uh, grow and plant. And he's writing to these believers, both Jews and Gentiles, kind of telling them about uh, the, the saving grace that God has for all humanity, what it looks like, how they interact with it. And in the, the beginning, he he writes this passage and he just, it's a really beautiful passage, a very deep one that creates, that has quite a lot of theology in it. And it really speaks to what we're looking at today, our assurance, the Holy Spirit. So I want to, I want to read through it. Verse 11, in him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So as Paul's writing this, this 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 short little passage, he just kind of drops some bombs in there. There's some very deep, rich theology that he just kind of glosses over that I'm sure some of you have caught. There are two very big theological concepts that have really play a big role in the debate now uh, amongst the evangelical churches. There, there are two of them that I've seen the most discussion spawn out of, and I want to I wanna just spend a minute going through them, partially because I just uh, they, they can be difficult. We don't want to skip the difficult things. They're there. We don't want to just ignore them. And so these two theology, these two theological points are this. The first one has to do with this predestined, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of of his will. And Paul's writing about this, uh, this theology that we would call uh, predestination or election. And there's two very uh, different opposing sides of this theological debate. The first one is uh, along the lines of what we call predestination. It's this belief that before time, God selected individuals, the elect, to receive his grace. And then on the other side, and there's a lot of gray in between here. These are the two uh, like main positions that people take their belief from. The other side just relies on this idea of free will, like true 100% free will about people receiving grace. And so when we come to this passage, it really gives us two interpretations, two different interpretations, our main different interpretations. The first one goes along with this predestination or election. Paul's writing to these Jews and Gentiles, and he's saying to them that you individuals were chosen specifically by God to receive grace. And then on the other side, the interpretation would be that this predestination that he's speaking of right here is kind of this general idea that he's writing to the Jews or the Gentiles or both that he's addressing in this point, that they have been chosen at this time to receive, to come into the family of God under the grace of Jesus. Uh, They're no longer under the law or completely separate from God, but they've been brought in at this time. And so those are the two opposing viewpoints. There's, of course, little, uh, there's other ones that kind of um, a mix of the two. And then the second one that we see comes at verse 13. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And it's this theological debate about what we would call perseverance of the saints or our security of the believer. And it really boils down to, can you or can you not lose your salvation? And in my life, what I've seen that, how that, how that comes out is people looking at someone that they may have grown up with or that they had a deep relationship that were, they believed to be followers. And then they see them walk away from the faith, maybe renounce it completely and trying to understand how did that work where once they were saved, they're not and, and that's really what that is often taken to, to mean. And so we have these two big theological debates, and they're important. And I, I bring them up not to point to one way or the other or dismiss your, your, what you hold, but really to ask you to just put them to the side, to put them to the side for the next 20-ish minutes so that we can look at what you would miss if you kind of hold on to those. Because these, these debates, these theological positions, often people grasp onto them. We want to, they want to be reinforced or they want to be argued. And that's not wrong. I'm not against them. I just ask you to put them aside so that you can hear the beauty in this passage. Because there's something really important in here for all of us as believers about our salvation, our inheritance, and really the work of the Spirit. 
And so as we read through this passage, one of the beautiful parts of it is we get to see the entirety of the Trinity, all three persons of the Godhead working in our salvation, our sanctification, our inheritance. And as Paul's been writing this, you may have caught, he just drops a lot of pronouns in there. A lot of pronouns, he's bouncing back and forth between the different God, uh, persons of the Trinity. It can create a lot of confusion, especially when you blast through it. And so I want to go back through them. And in the parentheses, I added these afterwards to clarify who he's talking about. So it says, in him, that is the son, we have attained an inheritance that through Jesus Christ, his work on the cross and resurrection from the grave, defeating sin and death, we obtain an inheritance. And this is intimately, intrinsically tied with our salvation, that we get that because of the work Jesus does. And it goes on saying, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, that is the Father, who works all things according to the counsel of his, the Father's will. And so it shows the relationship of how the Father and the Son are working here in our salvation and in our inheritance. Jesus comes to earth. He lives his perfect life. He dies on the cross. He comes back to life. He gives us this, this uh, he presents us as justified in front of God. But this is all done according to the will and under the authority of the Father. The Father, God, is kind of saying, this is my plan for redemption, and Jesus acts it out on earth. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's what he's doing when he's praying to God. I, I, paraphrasing, he's saying, God, I don't want to go through with this, but not my will, but yours. He's submitting to the will and the authority of the Father. And it goes on, verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his, the Father's glory, that all of this is done, yes, to reconcile us to him, but ultimately for his glory. It continues, verse 13, in him, the Son, you also. So now he's, where previously he was specifically addressing Jews, he's now addressing the Gentiles in the area. You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, again, the Son, Jesus Christ, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So finally, we see the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and he's involved intimately with this. His, he has a role in our salvation, our inheritance, our sanctification. And finally, we see this, all three persons of the triune God, all of them God, but none of them each other, working in unity for our good. They are working together. And this is really important to understand because often when we think of salvation, we look at the Father and the Son, and most people uh, come to a very clear understanding how, how they work together. But often what I've seen is there's this picture of the Holy Spirit. He's kind of this rogue agent off to the side and the father and the son, they're doing their job and he's just kind of hanging out. And then right out the end, he just kind of jumps in there and, and we get him and we don't really know what he does, but he's there. Uh, but he's always been involved. He was involved at creation. He's involved in this process. The father ha who, who has the plan, the will for our redemption, Jesus Christ dying for our sins, paying the cost for our sins. And then immediately after we believe, the Holy Spirit being our seal, all three working together in perfect unity for us. And it ends, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? to the praise of his, the Father's glory. Again, all of this done, not just for us, but for the glory of the Father. And so really, what is the, the role of the Spirit in all of this? What is his actual role? What, is he, what does he do? Because that's what we're trying to find out all of this sermon series. What does he do? And the first thing we see in this passage is the Spirit is the seal. It says it almost exactly those words in verse 13. It says, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And now one of the, the misunderstandings that I often hear that I had for quite a long time when we talk about the Spirit sealing is that the Spirit seals us, that he's the one creating the seal. And, and it's kind of this weird uh, way the word works, but actually what it is, isn't the Spirit is sealing us. The Spirit is the seal that the Father seals us with the Spirit. Uh, so when we are indwelled by the Spirit, He actually is the seal. That is what's part of what is happening in our indwelling. He is sealing us. And when I hear the word seal, uh, I, I, I have kind of a weird picture. I, I go immediately to food. 
because uh, sealing in my life, in a lot of people's life, really comes down to preserving food. All right, I, I'm done with my meal. I made a meal. I want to save it for leftovers. So I put it in the Tupperware and into the back of the fridge so that I can eat it for the next couple of days. But ultimately, it just sits there for two or three weeks. And then I pull it out and it's disgusting. Or I think of a mason jar uh, because of preserving the, the vegetables from the garden or somebody giving me the vegetables they preserved. And they go into our, our, our mud room and they sit there for months, years at a time with the idea that we can enjoy them long after the harvest. And, and they can last, you know, if it's done really, really well, they can last a decade. But eventually, no matter how we seal the food, they will go bad. They will rot. They will grow mold. They will be inedible. They will, they, will, they will come to ruin. And so if we use that idea of the seal, it doesn't apply here. That's not what the Spirit is doing. He's not sealing us like food to preserve us for a couple of years, maybe a decade, and then it's done. What it is, is it goes back to this idea that we don't have anymore. It's this ancient practice that they would have been very familiar with at the time when Paul wrote the letter. See, a seal back then, you know, a lot of you have probably seen it in the movie, was, was uh, attached to a letter or an order or a law, and it signified who had uh, instituted that law or order. It was usually a wax seal. Hot wax was dripped onto something. It might have actually been kept a, a letter enclosed. And then there was a ring that had an insignia that signified who it came from, and it would be pressed on there. And, and when it was, went out, what it would say to the recipient is who had sent it and whose authority such a letter or order a law was under. And it was important. It was, it was not commonplace. It was usually reserved for somebody in government like a king or an emperor, maybe a senate at the time of, of the Roman Empire. But it carried a lot of weight. And it said something to the person who received it. It conveyed something really important. And, and there's really two things that we want to see in the seal because it, it, it conveyed that then for uh, the letter, but it also is the same for us. It works this way for us. The Spirit of the Spirit being our seal set, declares ownership. When the letter would go out, it said, this is who it's done under, the, this is who has the authority of, this is who it belongs to. And when the Spirit indwells us and becomes our seal, it declares who we belong to, that we belong to God. And it reminds us, and it, de and it declares it to the people, the 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 things around us. It reminds us that we who once were slaves to sin, that we, that we were under sin, we were under death, we were under Satan, the desires of our flesh, we were slaves to them, they owned us. That's no longer true. That yes, they can still influence us, but they don't own us. We don't have to participate in them. We don't have to go along with them because we no longer belong to them. We belong to God. We belong to our creator and our savior. And we can be reminded by the spirit again and again and again when we listen to him that we are owned by a God who loves us and cares for us and desires us so much that he would die for us. It's important that we understand the seal is saying you are owned. In fact, it says that we're not even our own anymore. If you look at scripture, it says you were bought at a price. You are not your own. You belong to God if you have chosen to follow him. And it's a reminder that we need to hear day in and day out that we are owned by the most high. And not only does it remind us, it really speaks to the spiritual realm. It speaks to the spiritual realm. The Holy Spirit who we can't speak exists in the spiritual realm while he indwells us. It's really proclaiming to Satan, to his minions, that yes, they have influence. Yes, they have some amount of power that God allows them to have for this period of time. Yes, they can, uh, they can, imp uh, they can bother us, but in the end, they cannot have us. Satan can no longer have you because he does not have authority over you anymore. Only God does. It's, a, it's really a, an almost an armor that we can wear as we exist both in this physical realm and our souls exist in this spiritual realm. We are owned by God. And along with this ownership, what it says, the spirit as the seal uh, declares that the gift that we have received, the salvation, this inheritance, it's irrevocable. And when I say that, what I mean is that God is saying he is not going to revoke it. 
He didn't give you this gift of grace, uh, this free gift of grace to say that, oh, well, I'm going to take it back when you're not using it how I want, or you're no longer earning it, so I'm going to rip it back. He's saying what a seal would say in ancient times is this, this thing that the king is trying to communicate, that he was good for it, that his word meant something, that he wasn't going to uh, pull the rug out from underneath you. He was giving this with his full promise that it's going to happen. And the Spirit being our seal is God saying to us, I have granted you salvation and inheritance and it's fully yours. He has no intention of taking it from us. He is a good, loving God. Uh, this, this, this time, uh, this September, October, life groups have been going along with this sermon series. Uh, that's, we try to do that every fall. We try to work in unison. And so the life groups, they've had an option to study along with this, given two books that they could read. Uh, my life group's been going through this book called Help Us Here by Max Licato. And in it, he has this beautiful passage or this quote that I wanted this year because it really speaks to this idea of the spirit being our seal and that it is irrevocable. He says, your name is not written in God's book with a pencil. He does not hover an eraser above your entry just waiting for an excuse to remove it. He is no cruel master who demands perfection and promises retribution. He is a good father who has recorded your name in the book of life with the blood of the lamb. What a beautiful statement that he makes. That God isn't just waiting for us to mess up so that he can take what he's given us. He gave us grace. He gave us salvation through the free gift of grace and he intends for us to keep it. We didn't receive it through grace just so that we can hold on to it with works. We don't have to keep up our end of the bargain because there was no our end of the bargain. Jesus did the work. We received and we continue to receive, not because of anything that we do, but because of everything that he already did and accomplished. We don't have to worry about whether God is good for it. He has promised us. He has guaranteed. That is why one of the reasons why he has placed his spirit within us is so that we are know that he is good for his promise. Our inheritance is assured. The second thing we want to see in this passage about the spirit is that the spirit is the guarantee. Just in the next passage, verse 14, it says, Who is, that is the Spirit, the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession? The Spirit is the guarantee. When I hear guarantee, I just think of a promise. I actually think of an advertisement, like uh, guaranteed fresh are your money back. Uh, that, That really God's just saying the Spirit is a promise if we look at it like that, which is really weird that the Spirit is a promise. That doesn't really make sense. This word guarantee actually comes from the Greek word erevan. And what it means is a guarantee in a way that we don't often use it. It's still how it can be used in English, but it wouldn't necessarily be a guarantee so much as a promise, but a guarantee in the sense of a down payment. That what it's saying is the spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, which feels weird as well. Calling the spirit a down payment, it seems kind of heretical to refer to him as something as simple as that. But that is what the Spirit is. He is a sign of God's down payment. He's his guarantee for us that we fully receive. I want to make sure you hear this completely. We, at the time of belief, fully receive the Spirit, but the gift of salvation, our inheritance, our sanctification is progressive. It happens over time that when Jesus did and accomplished the work, we were freed from the penalty of sin. He paid the cost for our sin that we deserved. And we are being freed from the power of sin. And ultimately, we will continue to receive this gift of salvation and sanctification. And our inheritance is tied to that. It, the, the, they, they can't be separated. And so this inheritance that we're receiving, part of our inheritance we've already received. It is the Holy Spirit. And we will continue to receive our inheritance And what's beautiful is the Holy Spirit gives us kind of a taste now of what we are going to fully receive later. He's painting a picture through how he works in our life of what we get to have for all eternity. And so what is, what is our inheritance? The first thing is that we have eternal life. That because of God's work, we have eternal life 
Uh, that means we get heaven where we would deserve hell, where once we were fully separated for God, now we are reunited with him. We get this eternal life and with that comes resurrected bodies. We get resurrected bodies that conform to the likeness of Christ that one day we will be face to face with him fully. We will have bodies that are no longer perishable, but imperishable. We won't have to live in the body that is just falling apart from the moment we turn probably like 18 where we got back pains and neck pains and everything. We're, we're just wasting away. Eventually, we get resurrected bodies that are perfect, that, that don't have to worry about how sin has affected them. And ultimately what we get is freedom from the presence of sin. We will get freedom from the presence of sin. What a beautiful gift. It's actually really seems unimaginable that we live in a world that has been marred and, 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 and really wrecked by the effects of sin, that it has touched all areas of God's creation. I can't picture a world that isn't at some level affected by sin, but that's what we're promised. That right now there's, there's war again for what seems like the billionth time in my lifetime of Rome, there is war happening in the Middle East. People are dying and suffering because of terrorist acts. Because people hate each other. And there's fear going around. Is this the start of another big war? Is it a huge war? Is this the next world war? Are people that I love and care for, are they going to be sent off to possibly die or People I know in the military are going to have to face death. This sin affects everything. It's not just the big things, that murder, thievery, but even our emotions and thoughts, the, the, the feelings of shame and guilt and anger and frustration, the hurt that we experience, the depression, the sadness, all of that is a result of sin and all of that's going to be wiped away. We won't have to live with any of it. And uh, the Spirit is sealing us to, to, to that. He is the down payment for what all of this that is to come. And what's really cool is he's kind of giving us a taste of it today. Part of what we talked about, what the Spirit gives us is he is the helper. He is the parakletos. He, he brings within us this fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all to experience on earth, in the midst of the circumstances of sin, what we will ultimately get to experience for eternity as we are freed from the presence of sin. And I look at particularly love, joy, peace. We experience those in the midst of all the bad things of life, the difficult circumstances. We're getting a taste of what we get because ultimately what will happen is we will get to experience those things all times, not in the midst of or despite our circumstances, but free from all those evil circumstances. He is the down payment. It is God saying, you have an inheritance, but you also get to enjoy it today. You don't have to wait for it for when you, after you die, after you get to be with God, but you get it now because God indwells you. He seals you. He is your down payment of your salvation and your inheritance. And we get to live and bask in that. Really, the Spirit, He is a reminder. He is a reminder that although in this world there are no assurances, in the kingdom of God, we can have full assurance. I'm going to go ahead and release the campus pastors. I love you guys. Have a great day. All right. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, for a transformational moment, this entire series, we're just continuing to take a look at this blessed rhythm, this rhythm of life in which we uh, engage in the Holy Spirit, join Him in His work uh, to disciple people's, people where we live, work, and pray. And the whole thing, uh, just to go over it fairly briefly, it's about beginning each and every day with prayer, that we would be aware of how the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, but also the people around us, and we would join Him in His work that we would be willing to listen to whoever he presents in our life, uh, that we would fully be engaged, that we would listen to them, what is really going on in their life, not assume what's happening, but just listen to them so we can meet them in their hurt and in their need. And then challenge us to eat, to be willing to sit down to eat with somebody, uh, to, to invite them into your home, invite them into a meal, or even be willing to be invited when that happens uh, to open yourself up to conversation, to connection, because there's power over sharing a meal. And then to be willing to serve somebody, 
uh, to meet them, to hear as you're listening, hopefully hear where they need help in their life. It can be a very tangible, physical thing, helping them move, helping them mow the lawn, uh, but also just maybe serving them by being with them in the midst of their hurt, uh, their loss, and loving on them, and then ultimately sharing, sharing the gospel. And again, this isn't sharing just like uh, just whatever you've recited in your head, here's Jesus dying for you, and you get to go to heaven but being willing to share how the gospel has applied to your life and as you're listening, how it can apply to their life in a very real, tangible way. And all of this requires us to be in touch with the Holy Spirit, to rely upon Him fully, uh, to, to allow Him to work in our lives, to join Him in His work, because this isn't done in our own power. This is done fully in the power of God. And we really just want to challenge our church to be, to be committed to this blessed rhythm, to live it out day in and day out. If we're going to be a people helping people find and follow Jesus, it looks like living this out. And the, the uh, point is that discipling people doesn't have to be this big, hard, scary process. It really is just engaging in the spirit and inviting people into your life. I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for joining us.